Section 20 of A Book of Fairy Tales. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Michael Fascio. A Book of Fairy Tales by Sabine Baring Gould. Tom Thumb. In the days of King Arthur, there lived a plowman and his wife, who wished greatly to have a son. So the man went to Merlin, the enchanter, and told him that he and his wife had been married for twenty years, and had no children, and that they longed to have a little son, even if he were no bigger than his thumb. "'Go home, and you will find that you have one,' said the enchanter. And when the man returned to his house, he found his wife nursing a tiny, tiny baby, who grew to be the size of the plowman's thumb, but never grew much bigger." The fairy queen Vivienne was invited to the christening, and named him Tom Thumb. An oak-leaf hat he had for crown, his shirt of web by spiders spun, with jacket wove of thistle-down, his breeches were of feathers done, his stockings of apple rind they tie, with eyelash from his mother's eye, his shoes were made of mouse's skin, turned with a downy hair within. Tom was a healthy and happy baby. His parents were very fond of him, although he was so small, yet their love for him was very great. They used to hold him on their palms till he was old enough to toddle, and then they placed him on the table. They were afraid to let him run on the floor lest he should be trodden on. He was mischievous for all his small size, and as he grew to be a boy of twelve he was always at some prank or other. When Tom was old enough to play with the other boys, he delighted to do so, but then he was ever at some mad prank or other. At that time boys were wont to play with cherry stones instead of marbles, and when Tom had lost all his own cherry stones, he used to creep into the bags of his playfellows, fill his pockets, and crawl out again without their noticing what he was about, and join in the game once more. One day, however, as he was issuing from a bag of cherry stones, where he had been stealing as usual, the boy whose bag he had entered chanced to see him. "'Ho, ho!' exclaimed the lad. "'So, Tom Thumb, then you are at your usual pranks. Now I have caught you stealing my cherry stones. I have long suspected you. As I have got you, I shall punish you.' Then he drew the string of the bag tight round Tom's neck, and shook the bag well, so that the cherry stones rattled against and bruised Tom's little body and thighs and legs. He screamed for pain, and begged to be released, and promised that he never would steal again. One day that he had been at his pranks, he was shut up in a pin-box. This hurt him greatly, and next day he resolved to revenge himself. He took a number of glasses and hung them on a sunbeam. The other boys tried to do the same, but failed, and broke all the glasses, and were severely whipped for having done this. One day, while his mother was making a batter pudding, Tom stood on the edge of the bowl holding a candle in one hand so that he might see that the pudding was properly made. But as he tried to balance himself on one toe, when his mother's back was turned, he slipped and went head foremost into the pudding. His mother did not know this and continued stirring the pudding and put it and him into the pot. But Tom no sooner felt the hot water then he danced like one mad, and his mother was so frightened to see the pudding bouncing about that she thought it was bewitched, and she hastily gave it to a tinker who was passing the door. The tinker was delighted with his present, but as he was getting over a steel, Tom shouted out from the middle of the pudding, "'Hello, Pickens!' And this so terrified the tinker that he flung away the pudding in the field, and it broke to pieces, and Tom escaped." Tom then cleaned himself of the flour that stuck to him, and walked home to his mother, who had been in great distress because she could not find him. She gave him a lecture not to be rash and to get where he would be in mischief, and kissed him, and was very rejoiced to have him again. One day he climbed up the side of the cream pan and tumbled in, and would have been drowned had not his screams brought his mother to his aid. Another time he was lost, and after seeking for him everywhere, the poor woman saw his head popping out of the salt-box which hung against the wall, and he came out as if covered over with hoar-frost. 
when his mother went into the fields to milk the cow, she was wont to tie him to a thistle lest he should run away and get into mischief. If a bee came that way, then Tom, who was armed with a needle, fought it and carried off its honey. When a butterfly came that way, if Tom had not been tied to the thistle, he would certainly have jumped on its back and tried, if he could, to be carried away a sail in the air. One day a field mouse came and looked at him. Tom was afraid of the mouse, so he called to his mother, who came up, and the mouse started away. One day, while Tom was tied to the thistle, the cow, seeing his oak-leaf cap, took poor Tom and the thistle at one mouthful. But, being missed, his mother went calling him everywhere. "'Where art thou, Tom? Where art thou, Tom?' Quoth he, "'Here, mother, here. Within the red cow's mouth am I, full nearly swallowed up.' which made his mother weep and sigh that thus the cow should sup. Tom kicked and scratched till the cow dropped him from her mouth. His mother caught him in her apron as he was falling, or he would have been greatly hurt. One day Tom went with his father into the fields a-plowing, and the father made him a whip of barley straw wherewith to drive the oxen, but Tom's foot slipped, and he fell into the furrow without the father observing it. A crow flying by saw the barley straw, stooped, and carried Tom off to the top of a giant's castle. The giant took Tom in the palm of his hand, and laughed much to see how small he was. Tom had his little sword of a needle at his side, and he pricked the giant with it, and he shook his hand, and Tom gave a jump, and went out at the window and fell into the sea, where a fish swallowed him. The fish was soon after caught and brought to the castle of King Arthur. His steward bought it, and ordered the cook to boil it for dinner. When the cook was opening the fish, to his great astonishment out jumped Tom, quite delighted to be free again. He was taken before the king, who made Tom his dwarf, and he soon became a great favorite at court, where he delighted every one by his gambles. Long time he lived in jollity, beloved of the court, and none like Tom was so esteemed among the better sort. The Queen Guinevere was especially delighted with the little man, and made him dance a galliard on her left hand. His performance was so satisfactory that King Arthur gave him a ring which he wore about his waist as a girdle. When he was out with the king, if rain came on he would creep up the sleeve of Arthur and lie there till the shower was over. One day Tom, who could not forget his poor father and mother, asked King Arthur to grant him leave to go and visit them. The king readily agreed, and taking him into his treasury, told him to carry away with him as much money as he could for his poor parents. This made him caper for joy. He found that the only coin he could carry was a threepenny piece. And so away goes lusty Tom, with threepence at his back, a heavy burden which did make his very bones to crack. Tom remained three days with the old couple, and feasted on a hazelnut so extravagantly that he grew ill. King Arthur became impatient to have his dwarf back again, so his mother took a sort of tube, through which people blew darts at birds to kill them, and she put Tom in and blew through it, and blew him back to court. He was received by the king with every token of affection and delight, and tournaments were proclaimed in his honor. Thus he at tilt and tournament was entertained so, that all the rest of Arthur's knights did him much pleasure show. As Tom's clothes had suffered much in the batter pudding and in the furrow, and in the inside of the fish, the king ordered him a new suit of clothes, and gave him a mouse to ride. Of butterfly's wings his shirt was made, his boots of chicken's hide, and by a nimble fairy blade, well learned in the tailoring trade, his clothing was supplied. A needle dangled by his side, a dapper mouse he used to ride, thus strutted Tom in stately pride. Tom used to go out hunting on his mouse with the king and the knights. Arthur also ordered a little chair to be made, in order that Tom might sit on his table, and he gave him as well a carriage drawn by six white mice. At last the queen got jealous of Tom, because the king made so much of him, 
and she determined to be rid of him, and when the king was away she had him shut up in prison in a mouse-trap. But he managed to squeeze himself between the bars, and, seeing a lame butterfly, he climbed on its back, and the butterfly carried him away. However, in passing over the sea he became giddy and fell off, when he was again swallowed by a fish, which was caught, and set out for sale in the town of Rye, where a steward haggled for it with the fisherman who had caught it. Amongst the rest a steward came, who would the salmon buy, and other fish that he did name, but he would not comply. The steward said, You are so stout, if so, I'll not buy any. So then out called Tom Thumb aloud, Sir, give another penny. At this they all began to start, to hear the sudden joke. Nay, some were frightened to the heart. They thought the dead fish spoke. The steward made no more ado, but bid a penny more, because, he said, I never knew a fish to speak before. When the fish was opened, out came Tom again, and he remained in the kitchen at Rye, and was a great object of diversion to the servants. One day he was put in the window, when a great spider observed him and came down to him. Tom made a gallant fight, yet the spider's poisonous breath at last overcame him. He fell dead on the ground where he stood, and the spider sucked every drop of his blood. When the tidings came to King Arthur, he was very sorry, and went into mourning, he and all his knights. Such were his deeds and noble acts, in Arthur's court they shone, as like in all the world beside was hardly seen or known. For him King Arthur and his knights full forty days did mourn, and in remembrance of his name that was so wondrous born. He built a tomb of marble gray, and year by year did come, to celebrate the tragic death and burial of Tom Thumb. His fame still lives in England here, among the country sort. Of him our wives and children small tell tales of pleasant sport. Notes Another English tale, a mere play of the fancy. It is found in chapbooks and in metrical form. Stories of same character among the Greeks. Of Philotas, a poet of Kos. It was related that he carried lead in his shoes to save him from being blown away. And of Archistratus, that when taken by the enemy and weighed, he was found to be no heavier than an obelisk. End section 20. Section 21 from A Book of Fairy Tales. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This reading is by Tara Tucker at www.terralynn.com. A Book of Fairy Tales by Sabine Baring Gould. Section 21. The White Cat. Once upon a time there reigned a king over a certain kingdom, who had three sons, so clever and gallant, that he began to fear that they might be impatient to reign in the kingdom before he was dead. Now the king, although growing old, had no idea of abdicating his position and power, so he thought that the best way for him to manage under the circumstances would be for him to divert the minds of his sons by setting them tasks which would keep them well occupied. Accordingly, he sent for them, and addressing them kindly, he said, "'My dear sons, you no doubt perceive that my age is advanced, and that I am not able to occupy myself with the affairs of state as I did when I was younger. I am anxious that the wants of my subjects should not be overlooked through failure of my powers. Accordingly, I have resolved to lay down the reins of government as soon as I am satisfied that I can have that which will amuse and content me when I retire into private life. Now, I have been considering that a pretty, frisky, faithful little dog would prove excellent company. Accordingly, 
I am prepared to surrender my crown and throne to that one among you, my sons, who furnishes me with the most acceptable little dog. The three princes were exceedingly surprised at their father's sudden fancy for a little dog, but by his announcement a chance of succession to the throne was opened to the two younger, who in the ordinary course of affairs would have had no such chance. They therefore gladly accepted the commission, and the eldest, fearing to be deprived of his rights, was fain also to start in quest of a perfect dog. They resolved, before they separated, to meet each other and go together before the king in a year and a day from that at which they started on their several journeys. Each now took a different road, and the two elder brothers met with many adventures, but as those of the youngest were the most interesting, you shall hear only of them. This prince was young, light-hearted, and very handsome. He was well-educated, and as for his courage, it was boundless. Hardly a day passed without his purchasing dogs, big and small, and of every description, mastiffs, bulldogs, staghounds, spaniels, beagles, lapdogs. Whenever he had bought a pretty one, he was sure next moment to be offered another that was still prettier and then he had to get rid of those he had already purchased, and to buy that which took his fancy last. It was, as can well be understood, quite impossible for him, who was alone, to travel the country with a thousand dogs about him. He journeyed on from day to day, not knowing whither he was going, till one day at nightfall he found himself in a large and gloomy forest. He completely lost his way, and what made matters worse was that a thunderstorm came on and the rain poured down in torrents. He took the first path that offered, and after a while he saw a glimmer of light before him and hoped he was approaching a cottage where he could obtain shelter. Guided by the light, he presently found himself before the gates of a beautiful castle. The door was of gold and laid with carbuncles, and it was the glow of these precious stones which had shone through the forest and had drawn him on. The walls of the castle were of porcelain in the most dainty colors, but the prince was so wet that he could not hesitate or halt to admire. He went up to the door, and there beheld a deer's foot hanging by a chain of diamonds, and he wondered who could inhabit such a marvelous castle. "'They cannot fear robbers greatly here,' said he. "'What is there to prevent anyone from walking off with this chain "'and picking out these carbuncles and so enriching himself for life?' "'He pulled the deer's foot, and immediately a bell sounded, "'which by the softness of its tone he concluded to be of silver. "'Then the door flew open, but the prince could see no one as porter. "'Only a number of hands appeared in the air,' each holding a torch. He was so greatly astonished that he stood still until he felt hands draw him forward and thrust him on from behind, so that though somewhat uneasy, he could hardly help going on. With his hand on the hilt of his sword, ready for whatever might happen, he entered a hall paved with deep blue stones called lapis lazuli and heard voices singing sweetly. Fear no more the flitting hands, they your lightest wish obey. If you dread not Cupid's bands, safely in the palace stay. The prince now lost all fear. He was confident that where so warm a welcome was offered, no evil was intended. Accordingly, guided by the mysterious hands, he went to a door of coral that opened of its own accord and gave admittance into an apartment lined with mother-of-pearl, out of which opened a number of other rooms, sparkling with numerous candles, and full of the most beautiful pictures and precious objects that charmed the prince's eyes and bewildered his mind. At last, weary of gazing at so many wondrous objects, he cast himself down in an easy chair he saw drawn up near the bright wood fire, and at once the delicate hands began to remove his wet, muddy garments, and other hands produced fresh ones made of the richest stuffs, embroidered with gold and picked out with jewels. He could not fail to admire everything he saw, 
and the graceful manner in which the hands attended on him. When he was quite ready and looked fresh and radiant in the costly suit he had assumed, the hands conducted him to a splendid room on the walls of which, in tapestry, was shown the story of Puss in Boots. The table was spread for supper, and two golden plates were laid opposite each other, with golden forks and spoons. The sideboard was magnificently furnished with gold and silver salvers, ewers, and much beautiful glass. The prince stood hesitating, not knowing whether to sit down at table or not, when suddenly there entered a dozen cats carrying lutes, who took up their places at one end of the room and struck the strings of their instruments and mewed out the most astounding cat song imaginable to the accompaniment of their lutes. The prince was obliged to stop his ears at the caterwauling, but he laughed so heartily that he could not keep them closed. What? odd thing will happen next said he to himself and at the same moment the door at the end of the hall opened and there entered a tiny figure covered with a long black veil marshalled by two cats wearing black velvet mantles and carrying swords of state they were followed by a train of other cats which carried cages full of rats and mice the prince was so much astonished that he rubbed his eyes thinking he was dreaming but the little figure came up to him threw back the veil and disclosed the loveliest white cat conceivable she looked very young and very sad in a gentle voice that went straight to the prince's heart she said king's son you are welcome the queen of the cats rejoices to see and salute you madam puss answered the prince with a bow I thank you for your kindly reception, but surely you can be no common pussycat. The magnificence and state that surround you convince me to the contrary. King's son, said the white cat, I am unaccustomed to compliments. Let supper be served, and the musicians cease their strains, as apparently, sir, you do not relish their music. Then the mysterious hands began to serve supper, and first they put on the table two dishes, one containing roast pigeons and the other fricasseed mice. The prince declined the latter dish with horror, but the white cat assured him that her cook had special orders to serve him with entirely different food from herself, and that he need not fall to on rats or mice unless he had a mind to. The prince, confident that she would not deceive him, at once began his dinner on the roast pigeon. Presently he observed that the little paw of the white cat which was next him was adorned with a bracelet, from which hung a miniature portrait. When the white cat saw that he was desirous of examining it, she passed it to him, and he was enchanted to see that it represented an extremely handsome young man who was remarkably like himself. The white cat sighed as he looked at it, and looked more depressed in spirits than before. The prince forbore asking questions, lest he should pain her, and turned to talk of other matters. He found the white cat very intelligent, well-read, and well-versed in politics. After supper they retired into another room, which was fitted up as a theatre, and cats acted there and danced for the amusement of the prince and the white cat. After a while the queen of the cats rose from her seat, bade the prince a graceful adieu, wished him a good night and peaceful sleep, and withdrew. Thereupon the hands reappeared and conducted him into a room he had not seen hitherto, hung with tapestry made of butterfly wings of every hue. There were mirrors reaching to the floor, and a cosy white bed with curtains round it tied up with pink ribbons. The prince retired to bed, and very soon fell fast asleep. Next morning he was awakened by a noise outside his window and on looking out saw that a number of cats were in the courtyard, some leading greyhounds, others blowing horns. Presently the hands reappeared and dressed the prince in a complete hunting suit of green and silver. Then they threw open the door, and he was conducted below, where he saw the white cat in a green riding habit mounted on an ape, ready for hunting. The hands brought up a wooden horse for the prince to mount, 
He did not see that he would have much sport riding on a wooden horse. However, as the white cat seemed to expect it, he threw himself on its back, whereupon the wooden horse began to prance and show his paces. The white cat on her ape went up trees in quest of eagle nests, but the prince had rare sport on his wooden horse and never enjoyed a hunt more in all his life. After a while, the whole party returned to the castle, and the prince and the white cat supped together as on the previous evening. When it was over, the cat offered him some ruby wine in a crystal goblet. Directly he had tasted it, he forgot his home, forgot that he was looking for a little dog, forgot everything except his happiness in the society of the white cat. So the time passed, in every kind of amusement, until the year was nearly gone. The prince had forgotten all about meeting his brothers and appearing before his father, but the white cat knew when he was bound to return, and said to him one day, "'Are you aware, my good friend, that you have only three days left in which to find the little dog for your father? Already your brothers have provided themselves with beautiful little dogs.' Then all at once the prince recollected everything, and cried out, "'What can have affected my memory that I should forget a matter of such supreme importance? My whole future depends on it. Even supposing that I were to find a little dog worthy to win me a kingdom, where should I find a horse swift enough to convey me home within the three days?' The white cat, seeing he was sore troubled, said to him, "'King's son, be not anxious and distressed. I am your friend, and will assist you to the uttermost of my power. You can continue here a day, as the wooden horse will convey you the entire distance to your father's realm in twelve hours. I thank you, gracious cat, said the prince, but what advantage will that be to me if I have not a dog suitable to present to his majesty my father? See here said the white cat, holding up an acorn. In this is a prettier one than exists even at the dog star. Oh, dear white cat, exclaimed the prince, why do you make fun of me? Then he heard distinctly a little bow-wow, bow-wow, inside the acorn. The prince was delighted, for a dog enclosed in an acorn must indeed be a beauty. He wanted to take it out and look at it, but this the white cat would not allow. She said that the little dog must on all accounts be preserved from the chance of catching a chill on the journey. And the prince saw that in this, as in all else, there was reason in what the cat said. He thanked her heartily, and was quite sad when it was necessary for him to part from her. "'The days,' said he, "'have flown in your charming society.' I would it were possible for me to take you with me. The white cat shook her head and gave a faint meow in answer. The prince was the first to be at the meeting place, where it was agreed that the brothers should assemble before proceeding to the palace, and great was their amusement and astonishment to see the wooden horse, painted with great red spots and with a brush of hair on its arched neck, standing in the courtyard, stiff and stark as if it had just come out of a toy shop. The prince met his brothers joyously, and they told him of their adventures, but he was very reticent about his, and they did not think much of the dog that ran at his heels, and which was that he had with him when received into the white cat's palace. The elder brothers carried in baskets two little dogs, so delicate that they hardly dared to touch them. As for the dog that attended the youngest, he was all covered with mud from his journey. When they reached the palace, everyone crowded to welcome them as they ascended to the royal hall, and when the two brothers presented their little dogs, no one could resolve which was the most beautiful. They were already arranging between themselves what disposition they would make of the kingdom, when the youngest, stepping forward, bowed to his father and presented him with the acorn. The king, much astonished, opened it carefully, and out there ran on his hand the tiniest, dearest little mite of a dog imaginable. The king was so surprised that he let it drop. 
But the dog was not hurt. It at once began to skip about, pirouette and caper, and even to stand on its head. The king did not know what to say, for it was quite impossible that any dog could be found to surpass this little creature. Nevertheless, as he was in no hurry to resign his crown, he said to his sons that, as they had been so successful this time, they must be set another task, and must find him a piece of muslin so fine that it could be drawn through the eye of a needle. If it had not been that the elder brothers had been worsted by the youngest, it may well be believed that they would not have been disposed to set out again. However, by this new task set them, they were afforded another chance, so they accepted it. The youngest mounted his wooden horse. It tossed its head, threw out its legs, and bore him at full speed to the palace of his dear white cat. Every door of the castle stood wide open, every window was illumined, and the hands appeared waving a welcome to him. His horse was taken from him, and he was conducted into the castle. The white cat was lying by the fire in a basket on a cushion of white silk. She sprang up at his approach and said, "'I did not expect you back quite so soon, King's son.' Then he patted and stroked her and scratched her under the chin, and she purred, and he told her of his successful journey and how he had come back to ask her assistance to procure him that which was now demanded by the king and which it was not possible for him to procure elsewhere. The white cat looked grave and replied that she would consider the matter and consult with some spinster cats in the castle who were very skillful. Then the hands appeared carrying torches and conducted the prince and the white cat to a long gallery which overlooked the river, from the windows of which they saw a magnificent display of fireworks. After that they supped, and the prince appreciated his supper much more than the fireworks, for he was hungry with his long ride. So the time passed as before, just as pleasantly and just as quickly. The prince often marveled to find the cat so agreeable a companion, so well read, and so able to talk intelligently about matters. He once ventured to ask her how, as a cat, this was possible. She replied with a sad smile, "'King's son, do not ask me. I am unable to give you the explanation you desire.' The prince was so happy that he did not trouble himself to take account of the time as it passed. But the white cat did not forget, and one day she said to him, "'It is now within two days of that on which you are bound to appear before your father. This time you shall travel in better style.' Then she showed him a gilded coach, enameled with the most beautiful pictures. It was drawn by twelve snow-white horses, harnessed four abreast. Their trappings, as were those of the carriage, were of flame color, embroidered with diamonds. Numerous guards followed, all in flame-colored livery. "'Go,' said the white cat, "'and when you appear before the king in such state, he will surely give up his crown.' Take this walnut, but do not open it until you arrive at your destination, lest the wind should blow away its contents, or mud from the carriage wheels stain it. Lovely white cat, said the prince, how can I thank you sufficiently for your goodness to me? Only tell me you desire it, and I will abandon the thought of succeeding my father in his kingdom, and remain here with you. "'King's son,' she answered, "'you have a good heart to say this, "'and to care for a little white cat "'that is good for naught but catching mice. "'But you must not stay. "'Good-bye.' "'The prince kissed her paw and departed. "'The carriage spun along faster than had travelled the wooden horse, "'but this time the prince arrived so late "'that he found his brothers had already proceeded to the palace "'to display the pieces of muslin they had procured. "'These were indeed very fine. "'They would pass through a ring and the eye of a packing-needle. "'But the king sent for a particular needle kept among the crown jewels "'that had an eye so small that everyone saw at a glance "'that the stuffs provided could not possibly pass through it. 
At that moment a flourish of trumpets was heard, and the youngest son of the king entered. His father and brothers were amazed at his magnificence, and after he had greeted them, he produced the walnut and opened it, fully expecting to find the muslin. Instead of that, he found a hazelnut. He cracked this, and therein lay a cherry stone. Everyone looked on in astonishment, and the king was congratulating himself that all chance of the task being accomplished was at an end, when the prince broke the cherry stone and drew out only its kernel. He divided the kernel, and in that was a grain of wheat. He opened the grain of wheat and found a millet seed. Then he became concerned and muttered, O oh, white cat, you have been making mock of me. At that moment he felt a cat's claw give his hand a scratch, and hoping that this was meant as an encouragement, he opened the millet seed and drew out of it a piece of muslin four hundred ells long, woven finer than gossamer, in the loveliest patterns. And when the needle was brought, it passed through the eye without any difficulty. The king was aghast, and the two elder princes felt their discomfiture, for nobody could deny that this was the most marvelous piece of muslin that had ever been woven. Then, after some consideration, the king said to his sons, "'Nothing is more grateful to me in my old age than to see your willingness to oblige me. Go out once more, and whoever, at the end of a year and a day, brings back the loveliest princess, shall marry her, and shall, without further delay, receive the crown, and reign upon my throne in my place. For it is obvious to the meanest intellect that my successor must be a married man. The prince thought he was hardly treated, as he had earned the kingdom fairly twice over. But... He would not argue the point with his father. Moreover, he was impatient to return to the white cat. Accordingly, he mounted his gilded chariot, and swift as the wind it sped, throwing up clouds of dust in people's eyes, and bore him direct to the castle of the white cat. This time she was ready expecting him, and had caused her attendant cats to strew the road with flowers, and aromatic herbs and woods and gums were burnt in braziers on each side of the way. The white cat awaited him seated on a balcony. "'Well, King's son,' said she on his arrival, "'you have again returned without your crown.' "'Madam,' answered he, "'thanks to your kind assistance I have twice earned it.' but the fact is, my father is so unwilling to part with it that I really do not care to have it. Never mind, she said. You can but do your best to deserve it. You shall take back with you a lovely princess whom I will find for you. In the meantime, let us amuse ourselves. I have ordered tonight a battle between my cats and the water rats, on purpose to give you entertainment." My cats, it is true, are somewhat at a disadvantage, for they dislike water, and the rats will naturally seek to carry on the conflict in their native element. So they walked together on a terrace, and saw the battle. The cats were in ships made of cork, the rats were in half-ostrich shells. The fight was obstinate and protracted. The rats threw themselves into the water, and then the cats could not follow them. The rats were finally routed, but by no means exterminated. Many live on to the present day. The prince passed the year as he had passed the others, in hunting, fishing, and playing at chess with the white cat. He could not forbear asking her how it was that she was able to talk, but she answered that it was not in her power at that time to explain to him many things that surprised him. Nothing passes so quickly as happy days, and if the white cat had not been careful to remember the time when the prince was bound to return to his father, he would have forgotten it. She warned him of it the day before, and told him that it remained only with him to obtain one of the most beautiful princesses in the world. But in order to do this, he must cut off her head and tail and throw them into the fire. What? cried the prince. My lovely... 
My dear white cat, shall I who have received so many favors from you be so wicked, so ungrateful as to sacrifice you? You say this merely to try me, whether I am heartless and selfish. No, indeed, interrupted the white cat. Son of a king, I know well your generous nature, and that it will cut you to the heart to seem to act towards me in a barbarous manner. Nevertheless, do as I bid you. It is necessary, not for your own happiness only, but also for mine. The prince's eyes filled with tears, and he could hardly bring his mind to do what he was bidden. He said all the tender things he could think of to dissuade the cat from urging him to do it, but she obstinately answered that she wished to die by his hand, and that unless he did as she required, she would be condemned to a hopeless and protracted age of misery. At last, most reluctantly, and with averted head and trembling hand, the prince drew his sword and smote. He cut off her head at one blow, and with the next hewed off her tail. Then picking them up, he threw them into the fire. Instantly there was a blaze and a flash, and the whole apartment was filled with light and the most delicious fragrance. In the midst of the light he saw a most lovely maiden. At the same moment the door opened, and a company of knights and ladies entered, each carrying a cat's skin. With every token of joy they surrounded the princess, kissed her hand, and congratulated her on being once more restored to her natural form. She received them most graciously, and then requested them to allow her a few moments in which to converse alone with the prince, to whom she would unfold her history and explain much that had hitherto perplexed him. "'My dear king's son,' said she, you were right in supposing me to be something superior than an ordinary cat. My father reigned over six kingdoms. My mother, the queen, was an admirable woman, but unfortunately for me of an inquisitive turn of mind and restless in her habits. When I was only a few weeks old, she obtained the king's permission to visit a certain forest and palace of which many wondrous tales were told and she felt that she could have no peace of mind till she had ascertained what truth there was in these tales. She set off with a large retinue, and in course of time reached the forest, and saw that it was traversed by a road leading to a superb palace, the gates of which were closed. But through the railings my mother could see the most delicious and varied fruit. Many of the fruits were quite new to her, and such as she did know infinitely surpassed those which grew in her own gardens. She at once resolved to taste this fruit, and was well assured she would not have a moment's happiness till she had done so. She ordered her servants to knock at the palace doors, and to rattle the gates and ring the bell. No answer was, however, given to these summons. She therefore insisted on ladders being applied to the walls of the garden, that she might climb over them to get at the fruit, but it was soon found that the walls stretched themselves in proportion to the length of the ladders applied to them, so that it was quite impossible to surmount them. The queen was in despair, but as night was coming on, she had her tent planted outside the gates, resolved to spend the night there, and renew her attempt on the following morning. In the middle of the night she was suddenly aroused, and saw to her astonishment a little ugly old woman at her bedside who was plucking at her ear. The queen, my mother, sat up in bed very frightened. Then the old woman said to her, You are a very tiresome, persevering, and meddlesome person, not to leave me and my sisters alone in our palace, but to insist on eating our fruit. I will give you as much of the latter as you desire, on one condition, which is that you let us have your daughter to bring up as our own. The queen, my mother, answered, Dear madam, is there nothing else you will have? I can give you most admirable receipts for making conserves of your fruit, and even for picking the walnuts. Will not that do as well? 
If not, you shall have half of the kingdoms my husband reigns over. The fairy answered, We want neither your receipts nor your realms. We will have nothing else but your little daughter. We will make her as happy as the day is long, and give her everything her heart can desire. It is a hard condition, said the queen, my mother, but inasmuch as she was an exceedingly inquisitive and, it must be admitted, a greedy woman, she at last consented. Then the old fairy took her into the palace, and though it was still night, the queen, my mother, could plainly see that it was more magnificent than anything she had ever beheld. But, my dear prince, said the white cat, of this you can judge yourself, for you are now in the very palace into which my mother was introduced. The old fairy said to her, Will you gather the fruit yourself, or shall I call it to come to you? My mother answered that it would be less trouble and more interesting if it came when called. Thereupon the little old woman screamed out, Apricots, peaches, nectarines, cherries, plums, green gauges, pears, grapes, apples, oranges, lemons, gooseberries, currants, raspberries, come, come, come. Instantly from every tree down hopped the fruit and ran, and ran, just like chickens coming to be fed, and the queen ate as much as she liked, and found every kind of fruit passing good. The old fairy now gave her gilded baskets in which to carry away as much fruit as she liked, and she laded all her mules and servants with it. Then she reminded the queen, my mother, of the agreement and next morning the queen returned to her kingdom, nibbling at the fruit all the way. However, it must not be supposed that she did not regret her bargain when she saw me in my cradle on her return. She was afraid to tell the king what she had done, and she tried to deaden her remorse by eating fruit all day long. Presently there arrived at the palace five frightful little dwarves sent by the fairies to fetch me and then the queen was obliged to tell the king, my father, all she had promised. He was, of course, very angry, and ordered his guards to surround and cut the dwarfs to pieces. But as fast as they were chopped up, they came together again, and persisted in their demand, as though nothing incommoded by the maltreatment to which they were exposed. Then the fairies came in a flaming chariot drawn by seahorses, took up my cradle, placed it between them, and went away, carrying me. I grew up surrounded by everything that was beautiful and rare, and learning everything that is ever taught to a princess, but without any companions, save a parrot and a little dog, who could both talk, and receiving every day a visit from one of the old fairies, who caressed me and spoke kindly to me, and assured me of her and her sister's protection, so long as I remained in the palace and enchanted wood. I was solemnly and repeatedly warned that if I attempted to escape, the most dreadful calamity would befall me. One day, as I was pulling out the drawers and turning over the contents of the cabinets in the palace, I found a bracelet, to which hung a miniature portrait of a very handsome young man. I could not keep my eyes off this picture. You must understand, Prince, that hitherto I had seen no men, and no women even, except the old fairies. Next time one of these latter visited me, I asked what that was which was represented in the miniature. She was much vexed at my asking, and said it was a picture of a sort of monkey that lived in foreign parts. Then I said, innocently, I should much like to see such monkeys. The fairy said I must never think of such a thing, or dreadful misfortunes would happen. However, I found I could take no pleasure in anything. I could not sleep by night. I was always anxious and longing to see these extraordinary monkeys. I told this to one of the fairies, and she said with a sigh, I see there is some of the inquisitiveness of your mother in you. You will come to a dreadful misfortune unless you overcome it. 
I said no more to the fairies, but I thought now of nothing but how I might escape from the palace and enchanted wood into monkey land. One day I put my purpose into execution. I got away alone from the castle and ran through the wood and was just about to pass the last tree when the three fairy sisters appeared before me. They were very angry and said that I had rushed on to the doom which they had cautioned me against. Now there was no help for it. I must be transformed into a white cat. But they said they would give me a retinue of the lords and ladies of my father's court in the same form, and they would render invisible all but their hands, the ladies and lords of the bedchamber, and all such as attended on the personal comforts of the king and queen, both of whom were now dead. As they laid me under the enchantment, the fairy sisters told me all my story, and warned me that my only chance of release from the shape of a cat was to win the love of a prince who should exactly resemble the portrait on the bracelet I had found, and having won that, to induce him to cut off my cat's head and tail and throw them into the fire. "'You have indeed won my love,' said the prince, "'and I am delighted to find you are such a fascinating monkey,' said the princess." Now it is time for you to return to your father. So the prince gave her his hand and led her down the stairs to the chariot, and they started on the journey. As the princess was as clever and agreeable in conversation as she was beautiful, the time passed very pleasantly. When they approached the castle, the princess stepped into a crystal sedan with a little door in it with silken curtains before it, and this crystal sedan chair was carried by her guards. All the people wondered what it could contain. The princes, the elder brothers, were on the terrace of the palace, each conducting a charming princess. On seeing their youngest brother, they hastened to meet him and asked if he had brought a beautiful lady with him. Well, said he, I could find none superior to a lovely white cat. A cat, said they. Were you afraid that the mice would eat up the palace? The courtiers now hastened before the king to announce that the three princes were approaching. "'Are they bringing fair ladies with them?' asked the king. "'Fairer not to be found,' was the answer, at hearing which he was much displeased. The two elder princes made haste to show their beautiful princesses. The king received them very graciously, and said that, really, each was so beautiful it would not be possible for him to decide between them, for he was as gallant an old man as he was cunning. Then he looked at his youngest son and said, So, this time you have failed. Not altogether, your majesty, said the prince. If you will condescend to look at my little white cat in her crystal cage, who meows so prettily, and gambles so playfully, you cannot fail to be pleased. The king smiled, and went to open the sedan chair itself, when all at once the princess touched a spring, and it flew apart, and she stood in the midst, like the sun bursting from the clouds. Her fair hair was spread over her shoulders, and hung in shining tresses to her feet. On her head was a crown of roses, her gown of thin gauze was lined with rose-colored taffety. She curtsied low to the king, who, in the excess of his admiration, clapped his hands and said, This is indeed the matchless beauty who deserves to wear the crown. Sire, said she, I am not come to deprive you of your kingdom, which you rule with such sagacity. I am queen over six. Allow me to present one to each of your elder sons. Then there will remain four for my dear young prince and myself. What with the housekeeping, that will be as much as we can manage. The king and all the courtiers gave vent to their joy and astonishment and loud and repeated cheers. Indeed, the king kept on hurrahing and shouting, One cheer more! till he became purple in the face, and had to be carried out and given a cooling draught, lest he should have an apoplexy. 
The marriages of all the three couples were immediately solemnized, and the court spent several months in rejoicings. Then they set out, each for his own dominions, and all considered that their happiness was due to the beautiful, wise, white cat. Extra Notes for The White Cat A tale by Madame de Aulnoy and Imperishable it combines the folk tale of setting tasks and that of transformation into animal form. To that is added the task of cutting off head and tail, as in the frog prince. The use of cold steel has been regarded as a means of disenchantment ever since the introduction of iron. The race of bronze workers, who used weapons of this amalgam, was conquered by the Celt with his implements of war of tempered steel and the subjugated race regarded the new metal with feelings of terror as something altogether supernatural. The fairies who enchant are in most stories the members of the subjugated race. It is possible enough the transformation into bear or frog or cat may originally have meant no more than adoption into a tribe of which bear or frog or cat was the totem. Or it may mean that in the race regarded as endowed with supernatural powers, the clothing was of skins, bear or cat skin, or even, as with the Ainu, fish skin, and that the man of the higher race, by means of his steel sword, recovered one of the members of his own race who had been carried away and adopted into the clan of the inferior race. End of section 21 Section 22 of A Book of Fairy Tales. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Betty B. A Book of Fairy Tales by Sabine Baring Gould. The Frog Prince. In the olden times there lived a king whose daughters were all beautiful but the youngest was the most beautiful of all near the king's castle was a large and gloomy forest and in the midst stood an old lime tree below which was a well the water of which was clear as crystal people thought much of this well they said that the water came up from the heart of the earth and was good for all kinds of sicknesses and they used on may day to put a wreath of flowers round it the king's daughter often went to this well and one day as she was there it was may day and all the well was set about with flowers as she leaned to smell the flowers and looked down into the water a gold ball with which she was playing fell out of her hand and tumbled into the well then she was very unhappy and sat beside the well crying then all at once she heard a voice from the water that called out why do you weep king's daughter she looked about her and saw a frog popping its ugly head out of the water oh you ugly creature said she i am crying because i have lost my golden ball that has slipped away from me and has fallen into the well be still and do not cry answered the frog i can help you but if i restore the ball what will you do for me dear good frog said she i will give you my rings and necklaces the frog answered rings and necklaces i want not then said she i will give you my silk dresses silk dresses i value not said the frog they would be spoiled by the water i will give you lollipops said the princess they would melt in the water answered the frog i will give you my little gold watch said she the water would stop the work said he then you shall have my little red shoes said she they are too large for my feet he answered then the gold comb with which i fasten up my back hair she said i have no back hair never had never shall replied the frog what then can satisfy you she asked and began to weep again the frog answered if you will love me and let me be your companion and playfellow and sit at your table and eat off your plate and drink out of your cup and sit on your shoulder and whisper into your ear and sleep on your little bed then and only then will i dive down and bring up your golden ball i will promise all this said the princess 
if you will only get me my precious ball but she thought to herself what is this silly frog saying let him remain in the water and associate with f's and newts and not seek to mix in human society now the frog as soon as he had received her promise drew his head under water and dived presently up he came to the surface with the ball in his mouth and threw it on the grass the king's daughter was full of joy she picked up the ball and forgot even to thank the frog she turned to run away stay stay called the frog take me with you i cannot walk as fast as you do but all his croaking was in vain the king's daughter would not hear it but hastening home soon forgot the poor frog who was obliged to leap back into the fountain next day when the princess was sitting at table with her father and all his court and was eating from her little golden plate something was heard coming up the marble stairs splish splash splish splash and when it arrived at the top it knocked at the door and a voice was heard calling open the door youngest daughter of a king so she rose and went to see who was calling for her and when she opened the door and caught sight of the frog she shut it again with great haste and went back to her place at the table looking deadly pale when the king saw how frightened she was he asked her whether there was an ogre at the door who wanted to eat her oh no she answered it is not an ogre but an ugly wet frog and what does the frog want with you asked her father my father she answered as i was at the well yesterday i dropped my golden ball into it and the ball sank to the bottom i cried greatly and then a frog came to the surface and promised to restore to me the ball if i would make him my playfellow and suffer him to eat off my plate drink out of my cup sit on my shoulder and sleep on my bed now he has left the well and has come here then the frog was heard calling at the door open the door my honey my heart open the door my dear remember the oath atwixt us both adown by the well-head clear the king said a promise is a promise whether made to prince or beggar to man or toad so the king's daughter went to the door and opened it splish splash splish splash in waddled the frog and stood by the princess's chair she sat down and looked very white and her heart beat fast then the frog said lift me on your lap my honey my heart lift me on your lap my dear remember the words to me you spake adown by the well-head clear so the princess stooped and took up the frog and set it on her lap and put her hands on the table then the frog said give me to eat of your dainty meat from your golden plate my dear remember the oath atwixt us both adown by the well-head clear so she was obliged to let the frog feed from off her plate the courtiers looked on and were very astonished as for the princess she could eat not another bite then said the frog give me of your cup that i may sup of your golden cup my dear remember the oath betwixt us both adown by the well-head clear then she put the cup to the cold lips of the frog and he drank a little drop but after that she could not take any draught from the cup then when the frog had eaten and drunken to his satisfaction all the court rose from table and retired to the drawing-room and the princess would have walked away and dropped the frog on the floor but the frog cried out take me on your shoulder my honey my heart take me on your shoulder dear remember the oath betwixt us both adown by the well-head clear so the princess was obliged to take up the frog and set him on her shoulder and then he put his cold lips to her ear and said fair maid do not weep tis time to sleep carry me to the bed my dear remember the oath betwixt us both adown by the well-head clear at this the king's daughter began to cry she could not bear to think of the clammy cold frog on her beautiful clean white counterpane and she thought that whilst she was asleep he might hop onto her face and wake her with fright but indeed she did not think she could sleep at all with the nasty creature in her room but the king was angry at her reluctance he said again that what she had promised must be observed to break a promise was dishonourable in a poor man it was most disgraceful in one of royal blood so she went to her room with the frog squatted on her shoulder 
and when there she threw him on her counterpane then the frog said chop off my head my honey my heart come chop off my head my dear if you love me strong be speedy not long and chop off my head without fear the princess was greatly alarmed but she got an axe and chopped and cut off the head of the frog then all at once there stood before her a beautiful prince and all traces of the frog had disappeared and he told her how that he had been transformed into a frog by a witch and that he could never have recovered his own shape again unless some young girl had promised to let him eat out of her plate drink out of her cup sit on her shoulder and sleep on her bed the princess was so delighted that she ran and called her father and mother and all the court and they all sat down to table again and ate a second supper for delight and surprise had made them all hungry again and at this second supper it was agreed that the princess and the prince should be married next day when the sun rose a carriage drawn by eight white horses with golden harness drove up to the door of the palace and behind the carriage stood trusty henry the servant of the young prince when his master was transformed into a frog trusty henry had grieved so greatly that he had bound three iron hoop bands round his heart for fear lest it should break with grief now he came with the carriage to take the prince back to his own country and the faithful fellow helped in the bride and bridegroom and then mounted the seat behind full of joy at his master's recovery of his proper form they had not proceeded very far before the prince and princess heard a crack as though one of the carriage springs had given way the prince put his head out of the window and asked trusty henry what was broken his servant answered it is nothing in or about the carriage dear master but one of the bands has given way that i had bound round my heart when i was in grief because you were changed into a frog twice afterwards on the journey they heard the same noise and each time the prince thought that some portion of the carriage had given way but it was only the breaking of the bands that bound the heart of trusty henry thenceforth all lived in happiness notes the frog prince a very ancient folk tale professor max muller believes it to be due to a blunder in the interpretation of words that the story represents the sun beloved by the dawn in sanskrit the words for sun and for frog are almost the same but this is mere fantasy the sanskrit is not a parent language to our european aryan tongues but a sister tongue and later in form than some of the latter his theory may be dismissed without further consideration the story of the frog prince is told by hallowell in his popular rhymes and nursery tales eighteen forty nine there is a scotch version of the tale the well or the world's end given by chambers in his popular rhymes of scotland the story is found in germany and is given by grimm there is clear evidence that anciently the tale was told in england in ballad form and now only fragments of the metrical version remain professor child in his collection of british ballads gives an exhaustive account of the various forms in which this tale is found end of section twenty two end of a book of fairy tales by sabine baring gould